Welcome on behalf of the Zeitstiftung Evelyn and Gerd Butzerius and the Butzerius Summer School on Global Governance to this webinar on isolationism and the American experience. Is the U US destined to retreat from the world? And we will record the webinar and put it on our YouTube channel later. Unilateralism and isolationism are making a comeback in the United States. Are Trump and his America First approach to the world a cause or a symptom? What are the ideological sources of the intimate connection between isolationism and the American experience? Will the COVID-19 pandemic undercut or deepen globalization? What impact will it have on US grand strategy? The United States seems headed for an inevitable pullback of its global commitments. What should retrenchment look like? Can Americans find the middle ground between doing too much or doing too little? I think we have more than enough to discuss today and the timing of our webinar is just perfect. We had the first presidential debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden just yesterday. And tomorrow, one of our speakers, Charles Caption, publishes his new book on isolationism in the United States. I would like to briefly introduce you to our speakers. First, we have uh, Catherine Kluver Eschbrook. She is the founding director uh, of the Future of Diplomacy project at Harvard Kennedy School. Welcome. Markus Keim is senior fellow at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Germans know this as SDP. He's based in Berlin and he spent the last academic year in the US as a Helmut Schmidt fellow in Washington, DC. Charles Kapschen is professor of international affairs at Georgetown University in DC and he served as special assistant to the president for national security affairs from 2014 to 2017. Our moderator today is Ali Aslan, who is a well-known international TV host and moderator based in Berlin. He studied in the US, he worked for CNN in DC and for ABC News in New York. Over to you, Ali, and thanks to all of you for joining this webinar today and also to our audience. Welcome. No, no, thank you to you, Sasha, and the Zeit Foundation for putting this very timely and important event uh, together. And as you said, indeed, the uh, timing could not have been more permanent and on the point. Isolationism and the American experience is the US destined to retreat from uh, the world. It's a big topic which we will be discussing throughout the next 70, 75 uh, minutes. Certainly no lack of issues to talk about here. But let me dive right into the current uh, events uh, and the current uh, headlines and get a quick reaction from the three of you. Jolly, uh, obviously we've uh, had a very testy debate, first debate between President Trump and former Vice President uh, Biden. Many people speak of the most undignified uh, debate that the U.S. has ever seen in the history of presidential debates. And obviously, we're talking about U.S. America's role here today. Um, and many people are saying that yesterday's debate was really a national embarrassment. It was an embarrassment, international embarrassment for the U.S. and might uh, have an impact on the international standing of the U.S. Uh, let me get your first take. Uh, thanks, Ali. Uh, uh I, um, I guess, you know, my, my main reaction was sadness. Uh, and it's the same emotion I have had since Donald Trump took office. And that's because he's really dragged the country down. He's put us in the gutter. Uh, and, you know, has the, has the United States made some mistakes in the course of its history? You bet. But has the United States on balance tilted history in a positive direction by holding itself out as a country that others have wanted to emulate? Yes. Do other countries want to emulate the United States today? No. Why? Because we have a president that lacks basic decency and integrity. 
He, had, he has completely fumbled the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and so when I was watching it, you know, my heart went out to Joe Biden because he stayed on the stage and he tried to push the debate in a substantive direction and speak to the American people. But it's very hard to do with a president like Donald Trump. So, you know, my final comment, I really hope these days come to an end in early November. Well, we will uh, find out soon enough. Sadness is the first and most important sentiment that the debate evoked in Charles Kupch and Catherine. I know you've been quite busy giving your assessment to uh, many outlets in the German media. Um, what, what's, what's your evaluation here? What did you see? Yes, it was a long night in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, as Sasha uh, didn't mention, but Ali, you alluded to, and Marcos and Charlie know well, I'm German-American, and so um, qua passport and privilege, uh, I try to explain as best I can to the country in which I was born um, what is going on here, and frankly, that's been very difficult, and I think Charlie really pinned the needle there to say that it's been disappointing and disheartening to watch what over the course of three and a half years has happened to a proud American democracy. I think of it, you know, as the institutions providing the skeleton and the norms providing um, effectively the bone marrow to uphold the integrity of any system. And I think we were all surprised internationally um, and taken on a flat foot at how quickly the norms bled out of the American system and how brittle the architecture has become. And so yesterday's display I know evoked for many of the Europeans listening, you know, disappointment, um, sadness, deep concern, because it sort of showed how brittle this American democracy was. The fact that the president spent the latter part of the, you know, five minutes uh, raging against the electoral system as it is designed. And in fact, gave off an aura that, you know, this debate didn't deign his presence or a civil conversation. That to me is a behavior of an autocrat. You know, I kept thinking that he must be thinking, you know, Vladimir Putin doesn't have to submit himself to this type of theater. So, um, you know, I think the Europeans see this with disappointment, but conversely, and we're here to talk about isolationism and the American standing in the world, um, it makes the United States lose, as Charlie alluded, influence. Uh, and moral high ground, and trying to recapture that, even if the president's name is Joe Biden, uh, in January or in November, but certainly in January when uh, a new president has to take office, that will be the fundamental work of the coming four years. And I'm not sure, based on how incisive this has been, uh, not the debate, but the last four years, that you know we're going to be able to rebuild that international role, that influence, that morality, um, and, you know, frankly, the exemplar character that, for better or worse, as Charlie said, the United States has played over certainly the last 70 years. And certainly that's an issue that we will dive into much more uh, detail and deeper as uh, this discussion is uh, uh, going to evolve. But uh, disappointment, concern, and uh, sadness uh, is what Catherine Kluver Ashbrook uh, felt watching those uh, 75 minutes on stage. Marcus, you just uh, came back from the US where you spent a year in uh, Washington. You know the country well, obviously. Uh, let me also get your quick reaction on uh, what you saw unfolded there yesterday on the stage. Actually, uh, my reaction was threefold. The first reaction was I could have never imagined that I would witness some kind of pub brawl in which two prominent U.S. Uh, politicians would participate. Uh, I mean, from a European point of view, we are used to uh, see uh, polarization in the U.S. political system for, for a couple of years now. Uh, I'm not sure if the word polarization is appropriate more. It's, it's more about division of the country, division of the society, division of the political system. But I could never have, uh, I would never have imagined that I would see anything like this. And uh, we might have our differences here in Germany in the German political system, but uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of watching the presidential debate, I was really appreciating the political culture in Europe, or in particular in my country, in Germany, which modesty is is key. The second reaction, and that has to that leads us one way or the other into Charlie's uh, book. Uh, actually, I was surprised how little foreign policy played a role. 
I only remember one um, one moment when uh, Joe Biden accused Donald Trump to be uh, Putin's puppy. That was, in my as far as I remember, the only moment when something like foreign policy uh, appeared in the uh, in the debate. And it, from this point of view, it illustrates maybe uh, Charlie's thesis that the U.S. is inward looking in the process of inward looking uh, retrenchment from the international scene. And uh, I, I'm afraid the second debate and the third debate will will re-emphasize this this uh, this uh, d development. And to be honest, my third reaction was I'm looking forward to the vi vice presidential debate because, uh, given given the different uh, tone, the g different mindset of Mike Pence and Kamala Harris, whatever you think of them. I think we can look forward to hear more of a uh, political concepts, political visions than we heard today. And therefore, I think that that might give us some kind of orientation what we are facing in the months and years to come. Um, it is true that foreign policy was uh, hardly uh, mentioned yesterday. But to be fair, traditionally, the second debate between U.S. presidential candidates is solely uh, defined and, and devoted to foreign policy. So, uh, and that actually is a great segue to our topic today and to Charles Kupchen's new book, Isolationism, A History of America's Efforts to Shield Itself from the World. A very timely, very important book, obviously, uh, Charlie. But the title in itself implies already America First did not start with Donald Trump. Uh, Ali, you know, uh, let me let me start off by saying um, I'm not a fan of, of Donald Trump. Uh, I think it would be hard to find uh, people in American uh, politics that are less enamored of this president than I am. He's a very dangerous man. But I think we need to harvest some lessons from his presidency. And I think we need to take seriously the degree to which America first, to some extent, resonates with the American public. And it has deep roots in American history and American identity. Let me just make three quick points uh, and then get some response from, from our colleagues. The first point is that, you know, I started this book 2011, 2012, well before Donald Trump was a phenomenon. And I started writing it because I sensed that the American electorate was starting to tire of running the world uh, and of running the show in the Balkans and then Iraq and then Afghanistan. Uh, and, and so I said, you know what, I, I think I better go back and look at American foreign policy before Pearl Harbor, because we all know a lot about American foreign policy during World War II, the Cold War, post 9-11, and when I started to read what was, the country was like before Pearl Harbor, my head exploded because the U.S. from 1789 to 1941 really ran away from the world. It didn't run the world. It wanted to avoid foreign commitments. It shunned uh, entanglement abroad. And that's exactly what George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and other founding members uh, said. And so. My, my first observation was that Trump probably doesn't know this because he doesn't read, he doesn't know American history, but he's tapping in to an older strain in American political culture. Second observation is that when I began to read a lot of, of the history of pre-Pearl Harbor America, I began to see that exceptionalism the same notion that has led the United States to be deeply engaged in the world was also the concept that led the United States to run from the world. Because the idea was the United States needed to preserve its experiment, its experiment in liberty, in democracy, in prosperity, and save it from being tainted by the outside world. And in many respects, isolationism emerge from that narrative of America as the chosen nation. What then happens after Pearl Harbor is that exceptionalism becomes the narrative for doing everything. It becomes the narrative for if there's a problem, we will send out the fire trucks. 
And I think that worked pretty well during the Cold War when there was a balancer that engendered restraint in the United States, but it led to overreach after the Cold War. And I think what we've seen over the last couple of decades is the United States engaging in a level of, uh, of, of um, adventurism abroad that in many respects, the American public doesn't support and it's come at the expense of liberty and prosperity at home. My final point, I think that if you look at American history, we've had two big periods. One, 1789 to 1941, run away from the world. 1941 to Donald Trump, run the world. Donald Trump, let's go back to pre-1941. It's enough already, America first. Exactly the mantra that those opposed to World War II used to block Roosevelt from getting more involved. What I think we need to do now is find that middle ground. Find that middle ground between to doing too much and doing too little, between isolation and overreach. And I think that means trying to pull back from the periphery while staying in Europe and Asia. It means leading the world by example, no longer by invading countries like Afghanistan and Iraq and trying to turn them into Ohio. But if we're gonna do that, as Catherine and Marcus and I said, we have to be an exemplar. We need to get our house in order. And my final uh, recommendation uh, would be to, um, uh, to essentially be a team player. Right, we're now in a globalized world. Climate change, nuclear proliferation, whatever the problem is, it cannot be solved by America first. It can be solved only by America together. And in some ways, this is where Donald Trump has done the most damage. He's isolated the United States. He's left us lonely. We got to rediscover the importance of teamwork. Unilateral, very, very uh, insightful points uh, indeed. And unilateralism and isolationism, says Charlie Kaufman, are making a comeback in the US under Donald Trump. But it used to be the norm before World War II. It wasn't until uh, World War II and the subsequent uh, Cold War that the US really got engaged in uh, world affairs, uh, Catherine. Uh, if, if we look at uh, the previous three and a half, four years now, of Donald Trump's uh, foreign policy. Um, aside from the rhetoric, America first rhetoric, looking at the reality on the ground and the substance, uh, how would you evaluate those four years? So let me say first that we all have been very privileged, everyone on this panel, to be able to read Charlie's book in advance of its publication tomorrow. And um, I really do consider it a treat because as, um, you know, the title might imbue, is, one might think that Charlie's making, uh, you know, as we would say in German, a, a Plato Ye, a manifesto uh, for isolationism. I and mean, he's not doing that. And Charlie's genius is that he delivers a very nuanced, very measured historical look, but then also offers a thoughtful way, and he does so also in his Atlantic piece, which just came out, um, you know, a thoughtful way about how we might infuse some of these thoughts into an American, a wider American discussion about what future grand strategy has to be. He's not arguing for, you know, pulling up the drawbridges. And as he rightfully said, that's likely impossible in the way that the world is globalized. And so Zasha invited me here because I run an organization called The Future of Diplomacy Project. And so as I was reading Charlie's book, um, the word military is not in it as, as much as one might imagine because it is implied. Because to your point, historically, that has been the way that the United States has either decided to engage or not engage. So Charlie spends a lot of time in the beginning talking about how the United States, of course, in its natural interest, a national interest, pursued its commercial interests in the world. And so I think this is where, you know, my question comes to Charlie, but also, um, you know, how we think about the four years ahead if this president is reelected, the kind of arguments that this president has made for um, creating, you know, a powerful bastion again in the Defense Department. And you think about how um, he's allocated defense spending in a way that is no longer contemporary to the challenges that the United States and any global power faces. 
Um, yes, he's pulled us back, if you will, from any military adventurism, though nuclear tests are suddenly back on the table. Uh, and we are, you know, nearing a cliff with respect to our arms control agreements with Russia, certainly. Um, and he's, you know, put forth a pretty strong line on certain trade agreements. So it's not like he's been completely absent from the international stage. But arguably pulling us out of, or pulling the United States out of critical multilateral agreements that speak to the very nature of the challenges this country now face, over 200,000 deaths from the coronavirus. Climate change, this country has just been battered by a number of weather phenomena, fires, which he denied were linked to climate change. Those are global threats, and they're global threats that will affect the United States in part because of its location, because of its political system, in disproportionate effect. And so then that's going to take a different type of response. It's going to take a different type of influence, which is to say the military arena in terms of isolationism is no longer where you know, the threats are going to be faced. And I'm frankly heartened by the fact that the American public has realized that. So if you look at the next or the last Chicago uh, poll, the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations poll that just came out probably 10 days ago, 68% of Americans want more, not less, American engagement in shaping international affairs. And Republicans and Democrats alike see transnational challenges as key challenges. China is the number one concern of Republicans. And they don't mean the Chinese military, in sort of that classic sense. They mean IP theft. They mean data theft. They mean influence in terms of Chinese companies on American shores. They mean trade. They mean American jobs, right? And the uh, Democrats, conversely, are mainly concerned around COVID and the fact that the United States has been pulled out of discussions around vaccine distribution, et cetera. So Americans understand that the United States has to be at least amid to pick up on Jim Goldgeier's excellent uh, article in Foreign Affairs, amid a new discussion around great powers, and it needs to begin to reshape how it thinks about influence and positioning in the world. And I would argue that the United States has those tools, uh, it has the technology companies, it has the kind of levers that can create influence in a networked world. Uh, and I would hope <clears throat> that under a new administration, as Joe Biden did say yesterday about the Paris Agreement, uh, they're able to discharge that full tool set internationally in a different way, in a multilateral way. Interesting uh, figures that you pointed out there that over 60% of Americans are actually in favor of more US involvement with the world. Uh, Marcus, uh, there seems to be a common perception out there, at least on the part of us Europeans, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, the, the Americans actually are lacking the appetite and the appetite for US involvement in the world is declining. Isn't that the case? Yeah, as, you, as Sasha mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, I spent the last year in Washington DC at the German Marshall Fund as Helmut Schmidt Fellow. And one of the lessons I came back with to Berlin was how surprised I was um, how widespread this um, inward looking term or isolationist mood is in Washington DC uh, on the US foreign policy establishment. And not only, un, uh, not only among diehard Trumpists, but also under, uh, among liberal thinkers. Um, therefore, I think Charlie has a good case. There's no alternative uh, for the United States to, to retrench from the international scene. And it doesn't make sense from a European point of view just to call uh, for a revival of liberal internationalism as we had it for 70 years. Uh, so I think the expectations in Germany and Europe are way too high, which are associated with, an, with the President Biden uh, uh, starting in January 21. I think one of the key questions is, what does this all mean for Europe uh, as one of the key partners of the United States? And I think for the f last four years, uh, most European uh, governments have shied away from the proper consequences uh, of this development. They might have realized what's going on in, in, in the United States, 
they have realized to a certain degree that it's not only Donald Trump, that it's more widespread, that the public mood is about, to quote Charlie's, to, to quote Charlie's book again, it's about nation building in Arkansas and not nation building in Afghanistan. Um, and therefore, I think uh, everybody's desperately looking for uh, how, how the US foreign policy is evolving after after January 21 uh, because the alternative is pretty ble uh, pretty dark from a German and European point of view for the foreseeable future Germany and Europe will be will remain uh, crucially dependent on the United States in terms of national security collective defense and national defense therefore I think it's uh, it's would be wise from a German point of view to offer something to the new administration to keep the United States engaged at least, at least in Europe. But on the other hand, I think we have to step up to the plate and reconsider how Europe can fill the strategic vacuum the United States leaves behind, not on a global scale. I think it would be uh, too far to, um, to, to assume that Europe would play a role, let's say, in the South China Sea. But I think it's fair to expect from any US government, any future US government, that Europe plays a larger role in shaping and influencing the European neighborhood, which is difficult enough, uh, difficult enough in terms of how to develop a, a effective partnership or uh, this relationship with, with Turkey, uh, how to cope with uh, Syria, how to cope with Libya, and how to cope with the geopolitization of the European neighborhood, meaning uh, unlike 25 years ago when only there was there has been Europe to shape and influence the European neighborhood, now we see other actors entering the scene, meaning Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and China influencing and shaping the European neighborhood. Therefore, right. I think uh, any any uh, conclusion we, we we might draw from Charlie's book might have tremendous consequences for the policy process, policy making process here in European capitals. It's uh, I think uh, been already made abundantly clear that we have a great deal of uh, competence on the virtual panel, but I know there's also a great deal of expertise and competence amongst uh, our audience members. So. Please feel free to chime in using the Q&A button and I will try to insert and include your questions as we move uh, along. Charlie, um, to play devil's advocate here for a second, if we look at the most recent diplomatic successes of uh, Donald Trump, he's been able to uh, make peace between Israel and the UAE and Bahrain. People say Sudan is next and even Saudi Arabia. You've had the heads of state of Serbia and Kosovo sign deals in the Oval Office uh, recently. You have uh, high level talks between the Afghan government and the Taliban in Doha, Qatar taking place. Um, and despite his rhetoric, he got NATO members to pay up, to pay up and pay their fair share uh, uh, for, for membership as well. So. Um, would you give Donald Trump some credits on the international diplomatic scene? Um, I, I see even giving, even the suggestion of giving Donald Trump credit has, has made Charlie <laughs> speechless. So, so speechless. There, there you go. I have there. nothing to say. <laughs> Let, let me respond to your excellent question the following way, that on the surface, everything looks fine, right? There are troops, US troops in Europe, in Asia, in Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq. We just negotiated peace between Israel and UAE and Serbia and Kosovo and Leia, okay? I think that the issue is beneath the surface. We seem to be passing through a tipping point. And, and I, I wanna come back to what Marcus said, because I find it quite striking that he came here for the year, was at the German Marshall Front, was in Washington, right, which is the home of the foreign policy establishment, where we're all supposed to be globalists, right? We're the enemy for Donald Trump. But he came back to Germany saying, wow, something is changing in American politics. There's a turning inward. And my point is that that is happening beneath the surface and the country isn't, isn't making the necessary response to it. 
and there's a growing gap between our engagement abroad and the political will to sustain that kind of engagement. And so my message is we need to bring our engagement back into line with our resources and our purposes, because otherwise a kind of precipitous disengagement is at risk. And we've seen in the past that, you know, when, when McKinley launched the Spanish-American War, he didn't know that he was about to lead to a huge anti-internationalist backlash. Same for Woodrow Wilson. He went into World War I thinking this was the beginning of an American effort to save the world for democracy. What happened? He cleared the way for retreat. And so what I'm arguing here is that we need to see the writing on the wall. We need to pull back to sustain engagement. We need to find a new and stable equilibrium. And as Catherine pointed out, number one, commercial engagement is alive and well and has been from the very beginning. We need to make sure that stays uh, the case. I think the idea of decoupling from China is a non-starter. It's not gonna happen. She also, I think, made the important point that our allocation of resources is out of whack, right? We have over-militarized our foreign policy. And now we need to look at pandemics, cyber threats, other kinds of non-traditional threats to American security and invest in those rather than fighting these wars that really have led to very little good in, in the Middle East. So my overall message here is not pro-isolationism, on the contrary, anti-isolationism. But we need to find a brand of American engagement in the world that is sustainable, that the American people will support, precisely because, as Marcus was saying, we need to stay put in Europe. We need to stay put in Asia. We cannot afford to go back to America a fortress. I fear, however, that unless we get ahead of what's happening domestically, that could happen. Catherine, let us not shy away as Europeans to also be self-critical. Uh, transatlantic relations have taken a big hit under Donald Trump, certainly rhetorically, that's for certain. We've had a US president who openly uh, advertised and, and, and promoted uh, for Brexit. That is certainly something uh, that, that, is, that is quite disconcerting. But would you agree with the assertion and criticism that Europe, despite of what German Chancellor Merkel has said, that we probably, and we have to rely now more on ourselves than we did in the past. Europe has not used the previous three, four years to, for lack of a better term, grow up to, to uh, develop a, a, a common, comprehensive, uh, EU foreign policy and position. You see it uh, on, on many issues right now that are taking place in our European neighborhoods that Europe is not capable to deal with on its own. Yeah, um, I have a couple of points to respond to Charlie as well, but let me uh, lean into your question first. I think in many respects you're right, but not for the lack of trying given the circumstances in which Europe found itself around the 2016 election. So when I speak to German audience, of course, I think about that first year as a Schockstabe. It was completely, you know, just frightening um, to the point where, you know, I asked the uh, now German UN ambassador uh, who was the advisor to Chancellor Merkel at the time, I think it's probably three weeks after the election, you know, I said, look, as a German taxpayer, I would like to know that in the middle of the foreign ministry, you're doing strategic plans on leverage usage in diplomacy, on leveraging commercial and industrial um, ties to the United States. I'm creating a different influence environment that will focus this president, who's a very different person, on what the benefit of allied work is and close linkages. And the answer I got was, it'll all be fine. And we very quickly learned that it was not fine. And so what you saw that, all, you know, for, for seven years of effective, uh, you know, wider European foreign policy atrophy, and to be fair, we haven't had the integrated structures on the EU level for, you know, that amount of time, but you saw some scrambling. And I, I want to give credit where credit is due. 
because given the fact that you know in a networked policy environment Europe prospered post uh, German reunification in a way, you know, underneath the American nuclear umbrella in the way that was, you know, almost thought impossible when the wall came down, uh, you know, 30, 31 years ago. Um, but with this prosperity comes great responsibility. And so Europe has tried to catch up, play catch up, um, both nationally and internationally, I mean, at a supranational level, rather, um, by, you know, forging a closer identity for itself with PESCO, with common uh, coordination with NATO, looking very strategically at what it should be doing versus NATO. Marcus spoke about um, the European surround, particularly the South and the East. It's done more but arguably it's not done enough. Now, on a national level, the Germans now have a strategy for Indo-Pacific. I want you to remember that a German president left office voluntarily because he made a comment that German national commercial interests might have to be defended in Asia Pacific. That cost him his job. So in terms of a sea change in European policy, you're right. The election of Donald Trump has pushed a greater maturity on the European scale, but given the scale of challenges that we face internationally. And I want to say again to Charlie's point and the, the point of our discussion about what is strategic in the 21st century is not alone the military component. Russia is coming straight at the integrity of this democracy and the integrity of the system. They're creating frozen conflicts all around the boundaries, Nagorno-Karabakh, Libya, Ukraine, you know, influence in Belarus, yes, yes, yes. That's part of the strategy. But cyber attacks and other means of influence, they're coming straight for us, okay? They're coming straight for the United States, they're coming straight for the rest of the West. And China's doing the same, plus they're building an alternative multilateral structure to influence, to pull, to rein in. And so this gets to Charlie's point, I think, exactly. What needs to happen in the European or in the American context is we need to think very judiciously about what are our policy instruments. There's been a complete rupture effectively of diplomatic dialogue and exchange at all manners of different levels between the US Congress and the German Bundestag, for instance, and you know, between the European Union and the United States. I fault Donald Trump for that. So I do think that can be fixed and I'm optimistic. I think the Americans can walk and chew gum at the same time. And so I do think that this discussion that Americans have realized that cybercrime affects their credit cards, their credit standing, their own money. They have understood that trade deals that are not well thought out, you know, affect their jobs at home. They have understood that, you know, pandemics not properly managed result in death of their own family members. It's a need for a reframing of what constitutes international work, what constitutes a threat portfolio, and a new mustering of American tools to be out in the world in a way that's effective, recognizing that American power is changing. Marcus, uh, Chancellor Merkel is often being referred to as uh, the last adult standing in uh, the room when it comes to international affairs and certainly in her dealings uh, with uh, President uh, Trump. But obviously her powers are curtailed in this particular uh, front, uh, influencing uh, the, the, the current U.S. president. Um, wh what do you think Germany, uh, since this discussion is hosted by the Zeit Foundation, uh, what, and, and you obviously being a German who, who knows both sides, what advice, if you were an advisor on transatlantic relations, what advice would you give uh, to the Bundeskanzleramt? I think my, my advice, my advice, I mean, from a German and European point of view, we wouldn't worry so much about an inward looking in the United States if we would see an outward looking European Union. Um, an outward looking European Union, which is ready to fill the strategic vacuum at the margins of, the, of, of Europe or even uh, further away. Catherine just mentioned the Indo-Pacific. But I think I would fully agree or would fully subscribe to your notion about that the European Union has simply didn't fill the shoes over the last three to four years and didn't step up to the plate. I mean, 2016, 2017, everybody was running around talking about now it's 
now it's time for Europe, the, for a European approach, for a bigger role of Europe in the, in the international system. Uh, let's keep in mind that Ange uh, Ursula von der Leyen started her uh, time as European Com President of the European Commission with the major speech about a geopolitical Europe. She wants to create a geopolitical commission. So that's, that's a growing awareness that we have to do more from a European point of view. But if you, um, if you check the, uh, the, the accomplishments of the common foreign security policy of the European Union, not to mention the European security, the common security and defense policy, the picture is mixed as best. Uh, we still cope with the same problems we, we dealt with 25 years ago. Unanimity uh, um, um, in the voting procedures and in, in ineffective, incoherent uh, foreign policy approach. So it's difficult to identify a coherent uh, EU foreign policy towards the most relevant actors. A common foreign policy towards Russia, a common foreign policy towards China. And I think as long as the European Union is as inward looking as the United States is, tr triggered by different events, more or less by Brexit and now by Corona, I think uh, we shouldn't expect too much from Europe. And my biggest concern is that we are simply moving away from both sides of the Atlantic and inward looking the United States on the other, on the one side and an inward looking Europe on the other side. And the key question is, what keeps us still together, these two inward looking poles on the other, on, on both sides of the Atlantic? Uh, indeed. Uh, Europe, unfortunately, couldn't even come up with a common uh, policy on sanctions vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Belarus and, and obviously the, Absolutely. The, the conflict in the Caucasus right now and the scandal and tragedy and embarrassment in Moria, the refugee camp. All of those do not bode well for, for Europe's performance right now. That, that's certainly uh, the case. Now, I think I speak for all of our participants that this is a fascinating, very insightful discussion. Therefore, one that goes uh, by very quickly. So being mindful of the time, we have half an hour left and a few questions here already um, that have been uh, posed in the Q&A. Uh, Chad, I want to give those individuals uh, the opportunity to pose those questions themselves. Ishan Tarur, I hope your microphone is on. You're up, your question. Hi there, can you hear me? We can. Uh, I, I wasn't expecting to speak, but thank you so much. I really enjoy this. I'm Ishan Tarur, uh, Washington Post columnist in the Foreign Desk and Bucerius class of 2017. Um, I just, I mean, we've been talking about this in various ways uh, over the course of this conversation, but I'd love to hear the panelists uh, uh, really drill down on, on this question, which is uh, Biden has talked about, if he wins, initiating a kind of restoration of America on the world stage, whether it's on climate change, whether it's on returning to the nuclear deal with Iran, whether it's on uh, in general, bolstering the multilateral frameworks that Trump has undermined in various ways. But my question is, what, what can actually, how far can this restoration go? And what has four years of Trump, what kind of reality has it crystallized on the world stage? Thank you so much for this very good question. Uh, Charlie, you wanna take that? Uh, no, not really, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> Well, it's going to be one of it's going to be one of the three. So, so yeah, why don't you question. take a first crack at it, <laughs> uh, Ishan? I th I think that you will not find a person who is more internationalist, more multilateralist, more Atlanticist than Joe Biden. And you know, you read his foreign affairs piece. You look at what he's been saying. It sounds like that we're going to go back to business as usual. Uh, and that everything will go back to the pre-Trump era. Um, I don't think that's, that's the case. Uh, you know, I think there's been a lot of water under the bridge and that Joe Biden will do his best to restore some of the finer traditions of what we call the liberal international order. And he will have some success and he will fall short in some areas because the world has changed. 
And I, I guess the, the main observation I would make is that, you know, from really from 41 through Obama, we were operating in this world in which we presumed that a core coalition of Atlantic-led democracies anchored the global system. And we assumed that if we opened the doors of that system to Russia and China and Turkey and other countries, they would enter and they would dock at our harbor. And, and I think that that's not gonna happen, at least not anytime soon. And as a consequence, we're headed into a period in which the global distribution of power is much more widely dispersed, right? The Atlantic democracies used to be close to 80% of global GDP. It's now well below 50%. And so I think one key challenge will be, how do we manage global cooperation, multilateralism in a world in which the world's democracies are no longer the key anchors. How do we work with Russia? How do we work with China? These are big, big challenges. Uh, the second observation I make is that, is that Joe Biden, especially in the early days, would have uh, a great deal of domestic work to do. The pandemic, the economy, unemployment, bringing back jobs to the American industrial heartland, he will really be focused like a laser on getting the country up and running again, trying to repair the partisan divide. And as a consequence, I think he will have less time for international issues than many of us would hope for. Uh, but as Marcus and Catherine have been saying, that's where we are. We're in a world in which the democracies are generally inward focused because we do face this, this common problem. My final point would be in some ways to contradict myself and say that even though we're headed into a world in which Russia and China and non-democracies are gonna have more clout, I still think that the, that the first order of priority is to reanimate the democratic West. And by West, I don't mean just North America and Europe. I include Japan and India and other democracies in that. Because if we don't have our lights on, if we don't re-legitimate our democratic institutions, if we don't figure out the future of work in the digital age, there's no way that we're going to manage the global challenges of the 21st century. So I think the first order of priority is get the pandemic under control get our economies going, bring our democratic institutions back to life, rebuild consensus among the Atlantic democracies, and then go out and face the challenges that Catherine and others have been talking about, many of which do not involve military force. They involve addressing climate change, cyber issues, social media, and issues that in general have gotten short shrift over the last decade. Catherine, um, I, I think we all expect and ca could expect uh, a fundamental change of tone uh, under uh, President Biden, much more diplomatic. But when it comes to substantive differences, uh, Ch Ch Charlie has already said some of those things, uh, we in Europe and the rest of the world, we might be too idealistic and naive to think it's all gonna go back to what it used to be, he already said yesterday, that he will enter the Paris climate uh, deal. Europe certainly will have a better time under him. Um, what do you think will be the biggest substantive difference? Iran obviously is a big issue. It's a deal that his administration uh, uh, hammered out, something that Trump uh, withdrew from uh, the Iranian nuclear deal. Where, where do you see the biggest difference? Let me start from the inside out and in what Charlie just pivoted off of, which is to say that all Western democracies have been watching very closely what happens inside this democracy. I think Europeans were very confused that in the United States you could have voters who voted for Barack Obama in one election and for Donald Trump in the next election. So I think the first thing that you see that Europeans are very wary uh, of the fact that, you know, is who's the passing phenomenon here? Is it Joe Biden or is it Donald Trump? 
Meaning to say, could we four years later, when a Joe Biden is overwhelmed by all the compounding challenges which Charlie has just put in, uh, in front of us, you know, has set the table, and I'll add one challenge to that, which are the deep divisions in the Democratic Party, which, you know, this, this, they have coalesced around Joe Biden uh, in part to save American democracy, but those divisions are not inconsequential and they have foreign policy effects as well. Um, so if Joe Biden fails over these four years, you know, do we see a rise of another populist, another Trumpite? What's the state of the, of, of the Republican Party and what, what might that bring forth? So I think the Europeans are very wary at figuring out to what degree can they, can they trust this. They want to, there's a sort of a desperate need, in part because they want to go back to, as Marcus, uh, you know, defined, kind of sitting back and letting others take the wheel because of all the intractable issues that European foreign policy uh, has been wrestling with for the past 30, 35 years. But what's fundamentally against us, and Charlie alluded to that, is time. Russia and China are not sleeping. They are picking apart the European Union country by country, you know, with the Belt and Road Initiative, um, the European neighborhood, if you look at, you know, the activity of both Russia and China in the Balkans. I mean, there, so all of these things, these compounding challenges are happening simultaneously. And, you know, if I were the Europeans also, when it comes to you having the United States re-enter critical agreements, on Iran, you're going to need a completely new agreement. Okay? The situation has fundamentally changed. The fact that you have secondary sanctions against European companies, I mean, that's not just an affront, that's an economic bottom line question. The fact that the Europeans had to go and invest, in, invent effectively a separate payment mechanism to you know, circumvent these sanctions, I mean, those are real tactical issues which need to be straddled and you need, and you have a different situation on the ground in Iran. So you need a wholly different negotiation there and that's gonna be a much more difficult negotiation and the international partners, and by that I mean the Europeans, are going to attempt to extract value from the United States. And I think that's fair in diplomacy. And the same is true of the Paris Climate Agreement uh, in, in, up to a, a point. The Americans will have to rejoin but in some regards, I hope that the international community extracts a price, which is to say, do more, do more comprehensively, do more faster. Um, and so those are really challenges on an international parquet that this president is going to face with all the compounding challenges that Charlie has laid out on the inside of the country and healing a rift, you know, that has existed that goes far back uh, in the presidencies, but that broke open with this vehemence. So there is a critical question of trust, there is a critical question of faith uh, here, and there is timing that is running against the clock of sort of the integrity of Western democracies. And so that, that makes me very worried. A question, uh, certainly what would a Biden presidency mean for world affairs and Europe is uh, something that clearly is on the mind of many of our uh, viewers as uh, well, Deepthi Chubai, uh, an American living in The Hague over the past four years, has posed a question, though he says that Charlie has already answered my question in his last uh, response, uh, Marcus. Um, to be fair, though, if, if we look at Vice President Joe Biden under uh, an Obama presidency, this is a President, Ob President Obama who did not, despite uh, declaring red lines, did not get involved in Syria. Perhaps a conflict could have been solved by now in some uh, shape uh, or form. So again, I do want to go back and, and which ties into the book and the theme, of course, of, of Charlie. Yes, Bill Clinton got NATO behind him in Yugoslavia, in, in Serbia. George W. Bush, uh, very highly controversial, got involved uh, in Iraq. But if we look at the Obama presidency as a blueprint, perhaps, and only because Joe Biden was his vice president, we didn't really see a lot of U.S. foreign policy and an engagement there, did we? Absolutely. And I think we're going to see even less on the U.S. president, in term, at least in military terms. And I think it's pretty obvious that uh, President Biden would uh, continue the Afghanistan withdrawal, would continue the Iraq withdrawal, and one way or the other will maybe might even support the Syria withdrawal of US, US troops. 
So I think uh, that's not would be a reversal of the Trump policy. I would fully agree with Catherine's assessment that um, we would see some kind of low hanging fruits being picked first. The Par Paris Climate Agreement would be one, JCPOA and uh, renegotiation or, or additional agreement would be the second one. What really concerns me is a point um, uh, Charlie made about the reinvigoration or reanimation of the West. I would love to see this from a from a European and German point of view. And one of the um, events I would love to see would be a major speech by President Biden when we celebrate the anniversary of, of the building of the Berlin Wall next year, 60th anniversary. That would be a perfect opportunity to talk about the spirit of liberty, democracy, democratic values, and common bonds over the over the Atlantic. However, I think uh, reinvigoration of the West today means something different compared to 25 years ago, because we are now in a geopolitical or geopoliticized environment. And I think what we're going to what we have to expect under the, the Biden presidency is a continuation of what we have seen over the last four years. That, given the bipolar, the emerging of a bipolar system between China and the U.S., I think the United States will expect that European governments position themselves cl clearer than they have before. Uh, that a reinvigoration of the West means. You have to take sides. Are you against us or are you with us? Uh, something we have seen in the context of the Huawei 5G cases uh, in, uh, being discussed in all Western capitals. And therefore, we might see from a European point some kind of paradox. On the one hand, rhetorically, we might see some kind of reinvigoration of the West, which meant in the past that the influence of Germany and Europe in the international and in, in the international international system was growing and the costs have been reduced and the transatlantic relations in the 21st century might ex, might mean exactly the opposite that the influence of the Europeans in the context of the transatlantic relationship might be reduced and the cost might be increased because Europeans might have to take sides in this global competition between China and the United States. We have 15 minutes uh, left. Uh, before we go into the last uh, round of Q&A, and uh, there are a few more questions, so I would ask all three speakers to be a bit uh, more precise and concise for the final round. But uh, Catherine, I know you wanted to jump in on the point of reinvigorating the West here. Yeah, just a very quick two finger. Um, you know, there's a, there's a nice piece by Jim Goldgeier and uh, Jeff Hurdleson in Foreign Affairs, and they say, look, America needs to reposition itself as a mid, not a part, as Charlie's book takes us through, not a top right after the Cold War, but a mid. And so to Michael's point about how we redefine a multilateral system and how we might reinvigorate the West is by trying not to do everything by itself. So the Germans now have this alliance and the French have an alliance for multilateralism that reaches to Japan and South Korea. Largely still not enough effectiveness, but if you threw American throwaway behind it and said, look, this is our rejoining, change the narrative, change that focus, I think those can be pretty powerful gestures to say, we're participating, we're not going to try to come back out of a moral discount position to try to come straight back to the front. We're going to see, take a very critical look at where the state of the world is and then be amid in some cases in repositioning and re-anchoring the West instead of necessarily always having to be out front. Final round of questions, 15 minutes uh, left. Uh, Daniel could be. Uh, if you are around, turn on your microphone. You have a question specifically uh, to and for Charlie. Um, and it is about the current state of the State Department, uh, as a matter of fact, and how that might factor into uh, a future Biden presidency. Daniel, go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, Daniel, um, Buserius class 2003. So I was interested in hearing your comments on the uh, brain drain at state and how this uh, would affect the new administration. Um, is there still the institutional capacity 
to devise and execute foreign policy? Or has there been any um, loss of this capacity that would have um, any permanent um, consequences? Charlie, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Daniel. I mean, there's no question that the loss of capacity has been enormous. Uh, and part of it is that very good people have left. A lot of the people that I worked with during the last three years of the Obama administration when I was in the White House, they're gone. Uh, they either left right away or they left because they were fired or they left because they were demoralized. Uh, and it's gonna take some time to rebuild the ranks of the civil service. Is it, uh, and the foreign service, is it, is it going to be something that is irreparable? Can we say that it will be at the core of the problems moving forward? I don't think so, because I think there will be a re-emphasis on rebuilding those ranks. People will come back. There are individuals on the outside who will join Vice President Biden as political appointees who know what they're doing. The other thing I would say is there will be a restoration of policy. There is no policy today. There is no process by which the State Department, the Pentagon, and the NSC get together, debate issues, pass uh, ideas up the food chain to the president. It doesn't happen. What happens today is the president tweets something and then Washington goes into a tizzy running around trying to figure out what the president means and what to do. That will end. There will be the restoration of a, of a serious policy process. But I do think that some of the issues Catherine and Marcus are talking about are in some ways are, are more important. Uh, keep in mind that Obama was, was really a retrenchment president. He tried desperately to get out of the Middle East uh, and he didn't have a lot of success because of ISIL and Afghanistan was a mess. But, but there's no question in my mind that, that there will be a shrinkage. How to find that, that stable equilibrium, that balance between reducing America's engagement but sustaining enough engagement to preserve stability that's going to be very difficult. Another issue we haven't talked a lot about, but I think is very important, is the unilateral turn, particularly in, the, in Congress. Uh, if, even if Trump is gone, Republicans are not going to rediscover the desirability of treaties. If you took the post-World War II settlement today, GATT, Bretton Woods, United Nations, NATO, and you took it to the Senate and said, please ratify this, they would chase you off the grounds with a baseball bat, right? There's no way you could get that package of ideas ratified. Uh, and so for the foreseeable future, we're going to be operating in a country in which one major party in the United States doesn't really believe in treaty-based multilateralism. That means Paris Agreement, JCPOA, executive agreements, very hard to do arms control and get it through the Senate. So we're gonna to have to figure out a new way of operating that relies on coalitions of the willing, concerts, pragmatic partnerships, because I just think the Republicans have gone off the reservation for the foreseeable future. We are joined uh, amongst other by Alamin Usman May, who is the Minister of Economy, Planning and Regional Development. Uh, of uh, Cameroon and uh, I'm very uh, glad that she is joining us because uh, Africa is oftentimes neglected in discussions like uh, these. Alamin, uh, go ahead, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you, thank you indeed. Uh, thank you indeed, Ali. I, I want to really uh, appreciated uh, a different contribution made about the situation, but my simple question to the three uh, panelists is, uh, we are seeing uh, US as well as uh, Europe uh, looking inward. And uh, last night we have uh, witnessed uh, how uh, democracy and governance can be also assaulted publicly. Is it uh, a kind of inspiration for the African continent? 
The second part of my question is about the two uh, Europe and uh, America uh, continent looking inward. Doesn't it mean that uh, China will probably sit in the driving uh, uh, seat of uh, multilateral? This is the two questions, questions I wanted to share at this level, and I thank you for uh, giving me the floor. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for your important questions. Eight minutes uh, left. Uh, Catherine, you, you, you want to start this off? Yeah, sure. I'll just uh, go that and then I'll um, make some recommendations for Daniel on um, uh, diplomacy because I run a program on diplomacy. Um, so I, I completely agree. Look, China has uh, over the last six years alone developed a number of multilateral uh, institutions in its own guise. And uh, though it's no longer communism that it's spreading across the world, it's its own brand of authoritarianism. And it's doing it through those multilateral institutions um, and through these initiatives like the BRI, you know, effectively interest-free loans, particularly across uh, countries in Africa, and then extending its IT infrastructure, which it desperately needs um, the data that it brings home, quote unquote, from African countries where it builds IT infrastructure to power its AI dominance, which it has invested greatly in and which uh, it will is completely set to surpass American technological developments because it's operating a closed system, but where it can bring data home. So I do think that there is clearly a carving up uh, going on of the world while the West is either preoccupied with itself or preoccupied with its own old problems. And, you know, where America might be staying home, and like I said, I, I debate that notion to begin with in some regard, American companies are not. So where China is facing America now, particularly in Africa, and I think about this in the digital and data domain, it's American companies. And so we also need to think about how other actors are deployed in the international system and how they will shape wider state to state decision making, particularly how China reacts and plays, quote unquote, in the international arena. Um, very quickly on diplomacy, Daniel, um, I run a program on diplomacy. We have a new project out looking at the restoration of the American Foreign Service, which I commend to you. It's headed by my boss, Nicholas Burns, and three of his colleagues at the US State Department, or who used to be at the US State Department. And I recommend two other pieces uh, that you might look at. Bill Burns and Linda Thomas-Greenfield have done a similar exercise, but it looked at the uh, types and ranges of American foreign policy activity. And then finally, Anne-Marie Slaughter has a really interesting piece out uh, in Democracy just about two weeks ago that also looks at different ways of rebuilding the US State Department. And that gets to Charlie's point about changing the narrative around US foreign policy at home. And all three of those have a way of doing that, which is to take the conversation to the American voter, to the American citizen, but also to American Congress. So I would commend those three to you and I won't expound on them here. Thanks, Ali. Thank you, thank you, Catherine. Uh, and uh, since we have uh, five minutes left until we wrap up this discussion, um, I, I want to get your last, last words, really. Uh, the election is upon us, thankfully, might, one might say. There's no country that has a longer election campaign than the U.S., at least as far as I know. Um, and yes, on November 3rd, uh, or perhaps a few days and weeks after that, we will know. Um, Marcus, let's start in the reverse order, uh, then go to Catherine and Charles, uh, end with Charles for final remarks. I'm not going to ask you to look into an imaginary crystal ball, um, but, but use the last five minutes into how you think this is going to play out. Marcus. I don't know how it's going to play out, uh, but I can express my deepest concern or my, my biggest concern. And actually, it starts where Charlie has left off about the future of the insti international institutions as we have it. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm afraid he's absolutely correct that we're facing a, the future of a more fluid, um, informal system of in, international institutions. Uh, and we have seen this kind of pattern of cooperation emerge in over the last couple of years. The EU 3 plus 3 has been one of them, or P5 plus, plus 1. The Normandy format is one of them. Uh, the whole anti-ISIS coalition is one of them. So we see this already in place or we see this emerging. But my question would be, and maybe there's no answer to this, how effective can this be in a long-term perspective? Because institution manifests trust 
uh, of the of the parties which cooperate in this institution. And if you don't perpetuate this cooperation, you lose the trust which you have accomplished through cooperation. And therefore, I fully agree and accept the notion that we have to live with more informality in international institutions. But I think uh, we should appreciate what we have accomplished by this formalized institutions. And I don't have an idea how they will survive over the last next years. Interesting times as we just marked 70 uh, years of NATO, 75th anniversary of the UN, obviously, uh, as we speak. Mm -hmm. Indeed, uh, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Catherine, your final remarks. I mean, maybe if I can just pivot off of Mark's point, um, even coalitions of the willing need anchors. They need conveners. They need some sort of node, right? Networks need nodes. And if the United States isn't able to, you know, put together sort of the moral clout and the international trust in the system, that atrophies both the institutions, as Marcus and Charlie have rightly pointed out, that exist and weaken all other voluntary formats. And that is the thing that I worry about most because, you know, as a German American, I have not tired of pointing out just how dire uh, the state of American democracy, the integrity of American democracy is. Again, I remind you of my skeleton image. Um, those are the things that have me as a German American, as somebody who was raised uh, by a father who was born in the middle of the war uh, and saw the rebuilding of his country and as somebody in my generation for whom that has become a, a, a personal calling that this not happen again on my watch. That has been the most difficult part of these last three and a half years to watch a country that I love and respect be eroded from the inside. So, and you see, I'm getting emotional about this because I care very deeply about this. That is to me the most fundamental thing that's on the ballot on November 3rd. And so to the Americans listening, please vote. And you're doing a wonderful job uh, through the program at Harvard University. As we all know, you pour your heart and soul into it and, and your emotions as well. So clearly this is an issue that is very dear to your heart. It's dear to everyone's heart, I believe, here on this panel. And uh, Charlie, obviously, uh, being a graduate of Georgetown University is always a great pleasure of sharing this stage, virtual stage in this particular case, with a fellow Hoya, your book, Isolationism, History of America's Efforts to Shield Itself from the World, comes out tomorrow. Big recommendation, obviously, uh, from my and our side. Uh, your final remarks. Well, uh, since Catherine got emotional and made it personal, I, I, will, I will continue in that, in that vein. Uh, my, my grandparents fled Ukraine in the interwar period because Cossacks were riding around trying to cut their heads off. Uh, and thank God they left because there were many hundreds of Kupchans who stayed in Ukraine and they were killed in the Holocaust. Uh, and I grew up in Wisconsin, which is in the middle of the country, surrounded by lakes and cows. And uh, I was in the most decent state in the Union, in the most decent country on earth. And I said, boy, I am one lucky guy. Uh, if my grandparents didn't have the good sense to get on a boat and get out of Ukraine, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here. Uh, and I say that because I never thought that I would be sitting here in 2020 and say, I'm not confident that I can say that anymore. This is the most important moment of our political lifetimes. The United States has a president who says that neo-Nazis are okay, who talks about race uh, as, a, as a wedge issue in American politics, who is a not so subtle white supremacist. Uh, and I would say that there are similar forces in the United Kingdom, in Italy, in Germany, and this is a very dangerous moment for the world. Uh, and I would uh, echo what Catherine said, We've got to get out there. We have to get political. Because yes, the checks and balances that the founders put in the Constitution are there, but they're not enough. We see that in spades in many countries where democratically elected leaders have taken us down a very dark path. So we need to make sure that we are politically active to save ourselves from 
the darker instincts that Trump and others are tapping into. So I would end by saying, one, we got to get political, we got to vote, we got to organize because it's our best hope. Two, if Joe Biden wins, and I think he's going to, I am less worried about that than I am about what Trump does in the aftermath of the election, taking it to the courts, telling his people to go into the streets. That more worries me more than the actual electoral outcome. Uh, but if he does take office, uh, especially because this is a transatlantic gathering, I would say that Germans, Europeans, Americans, we need to come together as we did over the last 80 years and say this is as important a moment as we've ever lived through. And we need to link our arms and we need to stand by the liberal values that define who we are. I'll stop there. Well, I think I speak for all of those who have followed this discussion throughout the past 75 years in saying this has been extremely insightful, extremely educational. Um, and fittingly emotional uh, at times. Charles Kupchin, Catherine Kluver, Ashbrook, and Marcus Keim reiterating how high the stakes are on November 3rd. This wraps up the uh, discussion. Isolation and isolationism and the American experience is the US destined to retreat from the world. I think a lot of pointers that we can take with us moving forward into a world past November 3rd. Sasha, our work is done here. As the hosts, you have the final, final word. Extremely hard after this discussion. Um, I will not try to sum anything up, but uh, let me say it was a terrific session. Uh, I want to thank Ali for uh, an excellent moderation but uh, also our wonderful speakers, Catherine, thank you so much, Marcus and Charlie. Um, there were so many insights and uh, I think we now have a lot to think about. And uh, thank you so much. And yeah, maybe in due time, whenever that is, we will meet again in person. And uh, I hope to see you all very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you also uh, to our audience for watching us. Uh, I hope it was uh, also interesting for you. And we will put it later on, on YouTube so you can watch it again or others can watch it. Bye-bye.